Thank you all again for coming. I'll keep this brief uh, and get us going. We have a lot to cover, but our first speaker tonight is Mark Shim. Um, he's been working on community issues in our area for the last seven years uh, and spent five directly working with people experiencing homelessness uh, as the coordinator at Catholic Charities Warming Center and then a caseworker at Cooley Cap. And he is currently at St. Clair Health Mission as a community health worker focused on ER utilization. So Mark, I will turn the floor over to you. All right. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. So the other speaker is Julie McDermott. And um, Julie has been working on housing issues for basically her entire career. And that started with building homes of Habitat for Humanity, um, working with individuals as a housing specialist at Independent Living Resources, and acting as the project manager for the Cooley Collaborative to End Homelessness. She's currently the executive director of the Exchange uh, Across Area Furniture Bank and the youth program coordinator for Black Leaders Acquiring Collective Knowledge, where she is developing a homeless shelter, crisis line, and support services for runaway and homeless youth. Um, Julie uh, has her own experience living with mental health diagnosis, and she attributes this lived experience um, as what helps her really effectively connect and advocate for people in our community experiencing homelessness. Um, so that's Julie. So, let me advance, oops, oh, there we go, okay. So just a quick agenda for tonight um, of what we're gonna quick go over, or quick. Um, so we're gonna talk, we're gonna start with me um, doing uh, root causes of homelessness. We're gonna then take a dive into the data with Julie and some current strategies and some stuff we could maybe do better um, with Julie. We're going to do a uh, little bit about housing first and kind of talk about that. We're gonna watch a short video about that, talk about it. And then we're gonna kind of bring it around on kind of what's the hope, what's the good things to take out of this? Cause there are some really good things. Um, and so, and then we're gonna, hopefully if we have some time, um, we're gonna do a Q and A and discussion um, and answer any questions that people have. And we're gonna look ahead to part two. Um, of this series. Um, just a quick note on questions, just because Julie and I talk a lot, um, we have a lot of material tonight. Um, where if you have a, uh, that we're really gonna try and keep questions to the end, or if all sales people can follow up with Julie or I through email, it's just otherwise we're gonna be here until tomorrow or sometime longer. So, um, so if you can save questions until the end, and we'll hopefully have a little bit of time to go through some of those. So with that, let's get started. So um, I'm here to do some framing and background on um, housing. Um, I'm here to frame the house, as it were, or frame the not house. Um, and so I think it's really important when we start talking about homelessness to start with quick kind of establishing what home is and represents. Um, and a quote that is not mine, it's Matthew Desmond's. Um, he said, home is the wellspring of personhood. And so home is more than just the sum of its structural elements. It's more than just shelter. It's more than walls, it's more than a roof, it's more than a door, it's more than windows. You get the point. Um, it's privacy, security, it's companionship with our families and friends. Um, it's it's a gathering spot. It's where we relax. It's where we sleep. It's where we're able to hopefully be ourselves. Um, it's a space that notably we often, many of us decorate very specifically to reflect our personalities. Um, home is the anchor for our lives and for our, our identities in a lot of cases. It's critical to who we are as people. It's, a, it's as important as clean air, food, water, um, it is, housing is a fundamental right. And that is based on the importance of home. That's not just a phrase to say that housing is a right. Housing is a right because it is so essential to who we are and how we live our lives. Um, and so on the flip side of that, you know, we have homelessness and it's why homelessness is such a problem is because that's what we're, we're taking, we're effectively, when people are homeless, they lose that anchor, they lose that identity, that personhood that comes with a home and all of that, that all that's tied to it. 
And so you can employ all sorts of metaphors to think of why home and homelessness is a really intractable problem at, at times um, and for a lot of communities. And you can employ all sorts of uh, metaphors here, but you know the two that I think of is a crack foundation and a downstream consequence. And so homelessness as a downstream consequence, it's kind of a gathering point for a bunch of institutions and forces above it education, economic issues, race, culture, discrimination, systematic racism, all that stuff, all the things that aren't going well with our society and that in the ways that we structure how we do things and how we built our society, that all kind of just percolates down and collects as homelessness. And that's why it's so intractable at times is because it's not one issue, it's all these issues that have then come to kind of an end state down in homelessness. Um, and I think also a cracked foundation in that, you know, we have this house on top of it. At times, I feel like it, communities are kind of stuck with this house that has a fundamental piece broken in it, but yet we're up on the first or second floor, you know, hanging a new picture or painting or something like that, but we still have this fundamental problem. We can't get down to fix that. Um, so what does homelessness look like? Um, and it might seem like kind of an obvious question, but there are a lot of scenarios here um, that homelessness can be a lot of things. It can be the people that we see in the park, in the parking ramps, on benches, on sidewalks, and tents down at the park, um, stuff like that, that literal homelessness. That's very easy to see, people sleeping outside, but it's also people living in emergency shelters, um, people living under short-term stays in hotels, people living under eviction notices, people who are in housing units with too many people for what that unit is designed for. Um, it can, it, it's, so it's a lot of different presentations. Um, it's not just people sleeping in a park. It's a really wide array of scenarios. And who does it affect? Um, it, Homelessness is cross-cutting and that it cuts across education, um, class, race, culture. It can kind of affect in our kind of in our society where a lot of us are not very far from pretty dire straits financially. Um, homelessness can affect a lot of people. Um, so it affects, it cross-cuts a lot of people. Um, but I also don't want to mince words on this that. It's really important to note here that homelessness does disproportionately affect, you know, people of color, LGBTQ folks, people who already face intense unrelenting discrimination in our society also face high rates of homelessness along with everything else. So it does affect, homelessness affects a lot of people it can be cross cutting, but it's also, it follows the same fractures in our society and it hits the same people who are already dealing with a lot. Um, and I think it's really, so it, I think it's, it's in the description of this program that this is a humanitarian crisis, both at, at all levels, um, in La Crosse and La Crosse County in the state of Wisconsin and the country. And, um, I think crisis is an adequate word. We have people sleeping outside who do not have access to at times basic needs, um, and this is really costly. And I, and the word cost kind of makes me a little squirmy because it makes it seem like I'm just talking about financial costs and there is some of that, but this is a high cost, I would say to the communities where people are homeless. It's a high cost to the people experiencing it in terms of it shortens their lives. It exposes them to more trauma and violence and abuse. Um, it exposes communities to more of those things. And it just, it makes us worse as communities by letting it be there uh or for homelessness existing makes communities worse or makes it hard oh i can't yeah it makes us it makes us not as good of communities um it's very high cost then also in that financial sense in terms of emergency rooms um police utilization um, all sorts of emergency services it's very expensive in a personal sense the social sense and the financial sense. And I think 
it's also important to emphasize that there's a there's I, I think I would issue a challenge that we collectively as a society allow, we tolerate homelessness collectively in our midst and we allow it to be there and continue to persist. So we're all, whether actively or inactive through apathy, helplessness or act, direct action, we're all part of the system that produces and produces homelessness at the end. So real quick, some of the roots, some of these roots are really familiar because the root, they're the roots of a lot of problems um, because marginalization and oppression all kind of borrow from some of the same playbook, um, but particularly to homelessness. Um, literally the, the lack of housing, this can't be emphasized enough, a lack of housing, and this is, a, this is very true across, lack of housing that is affordable safe, decent, and accessible. So it meets people's needs, it's safe, and it's affordable at the income that is able to be made in this area. We have a distinct lack of that in this area, especially in the rental market, that finding a decent apartment that fits your needs um, and is safe and has all the things that you would like that are functioning is very hard. Um, lack of adequate and affordable medical care including you know, physical and mental disabilities, um, mental health care, substance use, uh, being able to access that care when you need it and getting the care that you need. Um, a lot of people don't have that and that's a huge barrier, either just through a lack of insurance or they're not able, they just have trouble interfacing with the medical system. Um, trauma and toxic stress. This is you know exposure to violence, uh, abuse, all, all of the trauma, all the traumas there um, that's, that make, that uh, stress people and marginalize them, pu push them out. Um, divert, even, even in a place like La Crosse where we have really some pretty dynamic resources, overall a root cause of homelessness here is that, that you have less or we have a lack of diverse community supports that can support people at different stages going through that and help them deal with a variety of barriers like different recovery options for substance use, mental health, um, accessibility, uh, criminal justice interactions. So, um, you know, in this case, really, it's that you end up going to jail. If you're in jail, you can't uh, pay your rent, you can't pay your mortgage, you become homeless. Once you're homeless, you end up sometimes accumulating more tickets that you can't pay and that just kind of keeps you stuck in it. Um, high rates of evictions and a general lack of knowledge of tenants' rights um, that landlords sometimes uh, can kind of push tenants around just because tenants may not know exactly what kind of rights they have under the system. And we, we operate in a system where landlords have a lot of power in that. Um, and then we have, a, we have a lot of need. We have a lot, the, the, the pool of people that feeds into direct homelessness that we see is very large. We have a lot of people, particularly across, that are close, um, that aren't making their rent, aren't able to make their rent or mortgage, um, that are already doubled up with family. And we have a very large pool of people uh, that feed into that. And then of course, in terms of roots, we can't forget the big systemic problems. Um, not, this isn't an exclusive list, um, but racism, discrimination, commodification of housing, wage gaps, billionaires, stuff like that. So um, those are, so th those are not all the roots. Those are some of the roots, but we could just discuss roots all day. So we're going to keep going. But I think it's really important uh, to note that often, especially in lacrosse, not in, and often in you know recent times, we've had discourse about kind of choices and personal responsibility, and the choices that people who are homeless are seem to be making. You know, why can't they just make better choices? Why can't they just not use drugs? Why can't they just pay you their rent? And really, the implication beneath that: um, why can't they just be better? You know, like us. Um, and that's a big question. And that's been in our discourse as a community in a, at times a not super helpful way. 
um, or productive way. But I'm here, at least in my opinion, um, to briefly talk about the fact that choices and the ability to choose are not equally distributed. I don't know how much of a statement, how much, how many people just went, well, duh, of course they're not. But you know, in a very specific way related to homelessness, I think of somebody like myself, um, say today that I had just arbitrarily, I had like a hundred choices I could make or made. Um, most of those are pretty easy, good choices that may either were neutral, that they're just routines, or they made my life actively better. You know, snuggle with my dog and watch Netflix. That's a choice I could have made today. Uh, buy groceries, go to work, stuff like that. Um, I have a lot of choices and most of them are, are, are good choices that make my life a little bit better or a lot better. Um, in contrast, I would say that somebody in homeless, who's experiencing homelessness might have 10 choices and very few of them and most of those choices are choices that are not going to make their life better but that's all they have available to them um and they maybe have one or two choices left that are like actually good choices but those might take more energy than they have just trying to survive or it might take more courage than they have or there are harder choices and there's very few of the good ones that are gonna help them make progress and make their life better. Um, excuse me. Um, and so it's really important to note um, that homelessness is a state. So in terms of when we're talking about choices, um, it's important to talk about the mindset that people are using are in when they make choices. And homelessness, notably, is a state of intense deprivation and toxic stress. Um, they're going without, they're going hungry, they're, they don't have access to their meeting their basic needs. Homelessness itself is a traumatic event separate from you know, violence and abuse and all the other stuff that happens when you're homeless, um, police interaction, stuff like that. Homelessness itself, just being without a home, that loss of identity, personhood is a traumatic event. And this deprivation and trauma distort and pressure decision-making. Um, and it's important that somebody, I'm gonna at least speak for myself, um, that's not currently in that mindset, um, that's distorted by deprivation and trauma. I can't fully comprehend or understand the pressure that people are under um, when they make decisions. And so choice, since I can understand it, it's pretty easy sometimes to point at choices that people make and say that they're irrational or bad choices. Um, and those are easy to easy judgments for us to make or for me to make. I'm just gonna say for speaking for myself, me to make if I wanted to make those because I don't understand what they're operating with. Um, and that they're under a lot of pressure, just surviving. And so their decision-making looks strange and hard to understand for people who are not in that position. I think it's also really important when we're talking about choices to talk about privacy. Um, they're out out there. Um, if I want to make bad choices, which I am free to make and do make bad choices that don't benefit my life and may like hurt me or people around me, I can close my shades, lock my door, and nobody may necessarily know about that, um, about my habits, about other stuff. Like I have privacy. And therefore, people don't necessarily know all the bad habits. Whereas people out in the park, there's not much to, you know, your, their choices, good and bad, are on display. They don't really have privacy. And I think that's a really, so the, the I think if you take anything out of this, this uh, quick segue into choices, into philosophy, philosophy of choices here, is that we need to look at the choices that people under stress make. And we need to find a way to look at that through a more compassionate lens that not necessarily condones or excuses it, but at least says, wow, I don't understand what you're going through. And so I'm going to, I'm going to try and support you and not judge you for the choices you make and help you maximize better choices and overall choice. So more compassion and help people find ways to make more, give them more choices. 
I'm going to emphasize this. If you take nothing else from this, this is the one nugget I would take. Housing is a human right and homelessness is inhumane and unethical. I'm hoping that the stuff I've already said just really supports that. But um, if that's what you take, I hope it's that. It's, it's something that we got to change. Our communities are worse for, for allowing it to persist. So I think that is. So with that, I am going to take a break and I'm going to pass it over to Julie in just one sec. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, Mark and I are actually here in my apartment today <laughs> because we thought it would help with our presentation for us to be um, together in the same room. So we have a little bit of um, finagling to do with our laptops in between um, swapping out. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for being present today. It's so exciting. I took a list, look through the participant list um, as Mark was speaking and see so many of our new council members or old council members present. So this is really tremendous that we have so many people engaged and who are here tonight to learn with us. Um, and I'd like to take an opportunity to just thank Mark too, because I think he's probably one of the most eloquent, eloquent speakers we have in our community and talking about root causes of homelessness and um, his uh, thoughts about the choices um, that people um, face and how that impacts um, their experience while homeless in our community. So. I'm going to do my level best to crash us through um, the data portion of this evening. Anybody who knows me knows that I could literally spend hours um, on this uh, particular topic, but I'm going to try not to uh, drive you all insane with that and um, uh, try to uh, scope out the bigger picture. But I think it is important as we talk about strategies in our community to understand the scope of the problem and where we can get the data points that we need in order to understand how it's changing as we apply those strategies and we can evaluate our performance as a community. Um, and so I, I will say this, I will preface this little piece on uh, data-driven uh, decision-making and that uh, none of this is mine. <laughs> I stole all of this from Carrie Poser um, from her presentation to our community this past January, she did a presentation. Carrie Poser is the director of the Balance of State Continuum of Care. We in the Cooley region, um, the Cooley Collaborative to End Homelessness, we are a part of the Balance of State for all practical purposes. HUD doesn't recognize La Crosse, La Crosse County, um, or the Cooley region. It recognizes the Balance of State, which is um, 69 counties um, here in the state of Wisconsin. And that's how we apply to HUD for grant funding. That's how we receive um, grant funding in our community um, is through this partnership with all these other counties um, across the state. And Carrie is the director there. She is an enormous herder of cats. She is very well respected, um, not just across the state, but across the nation for her expertise um, in housing and data. So I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel. I'm going to review a little bit some of the um, slides that I um, copied from her presentation in January. Mark actually has a copy of the full presentation that she did in January. And if you are interested in it, um, I would um, highly recommend diving into that. It's a great presentation. Um, there are five essential data points that we want to be taking a look at, um, both to understand the scope of the problem and begin to craft solutions, as well as um, data points that we want to look at to make sure that we are um, monitoring our performance and how well we're doing and um, in our efforts to end homelessness in our community. Um, let me just tell you, if you're not a data geek, it's no problem. Um, 
I will just tell you, I will just give you one pointer if you're not a data person, not interested in it. Here's just one thing. One thing I ask you not to do, please do not measure the state of homelessness in our community by doing a hand tally of the number of people hanging out in Cameron Park as you drive by on your way home from work. So I think we all, I'm being very glib about that, but I think we all um, have seen posts on social media where people point to problems and issues that are happening in our public parks. And all of a sudden, there's a whole lot of rhetoric about our homelessness problem growing and expanding and exploding. Um, and that's simply not the case. Um, ever since last year uh, with the pandemic, um, we've had more of a problem with homelessness being more, having increased visibility more than increased numbers. So more than ever before, people don't have a place to go. For a long time, people have been locked out of public spaces. Um, for a while, at the outset of the pandemic, if people left shelter, they weren't allowed back in um, because they had to be quarantined in order to get back into shelter. And so our population in the parks um, did go up, but it wasn't a representation of the overall population actually increasing. It was just becoming more visible because they had nowhere else to go. Um, so these are the data points you want to focus on. One is the point in time count, and that's something that you've probably heard about um, in our community, you've probably seen us on the news or read about it in the newspaper. We usually get a lot of media attention. Um, we go out in the middle of the night and we count. Um, we kind of scour the city. We have teams of people that grid out all over the city. We look in parking ramps. We look in encampments. We look along the river all of our parks and we look for unsheltered people. We put that together with the data that we have about people who are currently sheltered so we can create this sort of snapshot point in time um, of what homelessness looks like in our community. Every community across the nation that receives HUD funding um, is required to do this point in time count uh, one time of year. So when we do the January point in time count, we're doing that alongside all the other communities across the nation so that we can get an idea of what homelessness looks at, like um, in the US. Um, each of these uh, data points that's highlighted in yellow here, um, hopefully you'll get a link to this presentation um, so you can look back at it. These all have links to data visualizations that are available on the um, website for the Institute for Community Alliances or ICA. They are the organization in the state of Wisconsin that administer our homeless management information system. And they do some really great visualizations um, that provide data, not just for this year, but for years past and for communities all across the state. So you can go back, you can take a look at our point in time count data, see how it has changed. I think their data actually goes all the way back to 2013, um, all the way through to today, as well as look at how we compare to other communities um, in the state of Wisconsin. They also have a data visualization on total clients served. That's a very important number for us to watch. Um, for the number of people that end up in shelter, for the number of people that we count um, in our point in time count, there are dozens more that we serve in various capacities um, throughout our system, including prevention programs, outreach programs. Um, besides uh, shelter, we have people in supported housing programs um, of varying lengths and um, intensities. So total clients served usually runs around 1,500 to 1,600 people per year in our four county Cooley region. That's La Crosse County, Crawford County, Monroe and Vernon counties. Um, and so you can take a look at the data visualization for that there at that link. Another important data point is system performance measure reports. So HUD um, has certain uh, data points that it is looking at to sort of evaluate the performance of our programs, the use of our funding in our communities, as well as how we're doing overall as a nation in our battle against um, homelessness. Things that system performance measure reports take a look at include things like length of time homeless, because obviously we want 
want homelessness to be as brief as possible. So watching that number go down is really important. The total number of people experiencing homelessness, um, the total number of new clients experiencing homelessness, and we'll talk about why that's important to our community. We've done a really fabulous job keeping that number down. We have a really robust prevention program in our community. Um, and so that we've managed to keep those numbers down. We're some of the lowest numbers in the state. That's really awesome. Um, the system performance measures also take a look at the number of people who are exiting our system and going out to positive destinations, and then also watching how many of those people are returning. So um, it takes a look over two years um, once people exit the system, do they come back within that two year um, time frame? So those are all really important data points to monitor. Um, and you can take a look at those data visualizations um, through these links. Uh, the fourth data point is inflow. And I'm just going to go into a little bit of detail with inflow because I find this a little bit interesting. Um, inflow, we take a look at our shelter demographics. So who's in shelter, who's entering shelter, what that typical person is. And then we also take a look at migration data. So people coming into our community and people leaving our community who are homeless. Um, this is actually this slide that I'm showing you right now is a it's, it's a complete copy of a slide from Carrie Poser's presentation. So this is data that she provided to us in January of this year. This is representative of data collected October 1st of 2019 through the end of September 2020. In the Cooley um, region, there were 558 client households that entered shelter. 427 of those were households without children. 131 were households with children. And what we get from the demographics is that the typical client in the Cooley Coalition that's homeless is a 44-year-old white male, non-veteran, doesn't have children with him, non-Hispanic, non-Latino, and living with a disability. And when we look at other communities that are similar to us in size, um, we see that that's actually not far off from what they see as well. But that's a very typical um, homeless person in our community. And I share this slide on migration with you because look, I can't even tell you, as project manager for the Collaborative to End Homelessness, how many times I had to field the question, like, Julie, we have such great services here in La Crosse for homeless people. We have to stop offering all these services because we're bringing so many people. People are coming into La Crosse um, in order to get you know, these awesome services. We, we shouldn't offer such great services. We're just bringing people in from all over. Um, no, the answer to that is no, <laughs> it doesn't actually happen. Um, for years, we didn't really have a data point. This was the first time sh um, Carrie shared this data point with us. But actually, um, here in um, La Crosse, inflow from other communities into the La Crosse area was only approximately 33 households in that October of 2019 through September of 2020 um, timeline, but we sent 76 households out to other communities. So by far, we are sending more people out than we are taking in. So if you ever get that question, you happen to get into a family argument over dinner about whether or not lacrosse is um, bringing people in um, with their fabulous services, the answer is no, and here is your data point. But the thing that I really want to focus some time on with data is coordinated entry. Um, I happen to love coordinated entry. It tends to be that thing that all of our providers, when you say it, they run screaming from the room. Um, it was uh, an initiative, a strategy that HUD employed starting in 2015. And one of the um, one of the basic purposes of coordinated entry is that when you're homeless, it's really hard to understand all the different potential agencies in the community that might help you and all of the different programs that each of them offer, right? And we don't want people who are already in a state of crisis to have to run around like chickens with their heads cut off um, trying to figure out which agency is the right one to help and which program they're eligible for. 
And the way we used to do it before 2015, potentially they could have applied for program openings they were eligible for, but if they didn't get them, um, they might even have to apply again. So it was just sort of a, a terrible rat race um, for our folks who are experiencing homelessness. And so HUD said, we really need a better way to be able to um, give people access to the programs, the valuable programs and services that HUD funding provides provides in our community, and that is coordinated entry. So what that means is essentially somebody who's homeless can walk through the doors of any of our HUD funded agencies. They can receive the same assessment of their situation and be placed on a prioritization list for housing programming. And when any of our agencies has uh, an opening available, they have to go to that list and choose the person at the top of that list, no matter what agency referred that person um, to it. And so it's a very, it's a, it's a critical tool that's important to giving access to our clients, but at the end of the day, what it gives us is a real-time data, a real-time list of who is actually homeless and in need in our community at any given time. And not only that, they're prioritized based on some these, this standardized uh, assessment that we give them as providers. And the assessment includes um, us understanding the length of time that they've been homeless, how many times they've become homeless um, over the last couple of years. And we use a standardized tool to assess their risk and vulnerability while they're living on the street. So it takes a look at their um, mental well being, their physical well being, and their use of substances and other disabilities. So now we have this great list that tells us a number of people that we need to serve. And it also tells us a little bit about the types of barriers um, that they're experiencing and how we need to serve them. So again, this is a copy of Carrie's um, slide. This is a breakout of our um, households who are, are single adults who are uh, don't have children in their households. And as of January 2021, you can see um, at the bottom there that 143 households were on this prioritization list. So 143 households need assistance with housing. And I'm not going to get too crazy with all the details here about how they're broken out, but I want to point out the top two categories. So you can see chronic with disability, um, having been homeless for more than 12 months, and non-chronic with disability and more than 12 months homeless. So HUD defines chronic homelessness as somebody who has become homeless once and has been homeless consistently um, for 12 months or longer, um, or they have become homeless four or more times over the past three years with a cumulative total of 12 months or more of homelessness. Don't worry, there's not a quiz at the end of all this. Um, so, <laughs> but why I define those things is because these are folks with extremely high barriers. They're usually people who are facing um, physical health conditions, mental health conditions, substance use um, issues in their life. So dealing with a lot of trauma, they're a very hard to serve population. And in our population of our 143 people on that list, 42 of them have these are facing these really high barriers and really need a high degree of support and not only that, this next group, this non-chronic group, but that is living with a disability and has more than 12 months of homeless, essentially these 20 folks, these are being, these are being queued up. They're going to become chronically homeless any day now. So for all practical purposes, as a community, when we plan to serve the people who are homeless, um, we have to consider these top 62 people are going to need permanent supportive housing, meaning they're going to need a rent subsidy paired with really intensive supports for a long time, potentially even a lifetime. And that's, I think that's a really important um, point of data that we need to consider here in La Crosse, because we're not talking about 143 individuals that may get by 
with a Section 8 voucher or could get by with a couple of years of assistance and with meeting a case manager once a week. We have a really high needs population. The second slide is essentially the same thing. And this is, um, this is for uh, households with children. So these are families. You can see there were 18 families on our list in January and two of those households are in those um, top categories, meaning those really high intensive um, supports. So what does all this mean? Again, completely stolen from Carrie Poser. Um, a realistic look at need and the Cooley Coalition, if we had had a funder step up in January and say, I want to give you the money that's needed to house everybody in your community who's homeless as of today, we would have needed an additional 64 units of permanent supportive housing. So again, rent subsidy, really intensive case management supports provided potentially for a lifetime we would have needed an additional 77 units of rapid rehousing with intensive case management. Rapid rehousing is, a, um, is also a rent subsidy paired with case management supports. It's shorter in duration, it's about 18 to 24 months. In our community, we have no rapid rehousing programs with intensive case management. Um, we have rapid rehousing programs, but they're built for people with lesser barriers. Um, we have nothing that provides the intensive case management that um, uh, permanent supportive housing uh, levels provide. So we're at a complete deficit there. Um, we would also need another 20 units of the type of rapid rehousing um, that we have in our community. So we have a long way to go. <laughs> we have to figure out um, how to be able to serve um, these folks. And so Carrie talks a lot about something called right sizing. Do we have the right projects in our community? Do we have the right funding? The short answer to that is, no, <laughs> um, we need more programming focused on providing longer term supports and more intensive supports to those clients experiencing those higher barriers. And frankly, I think this also speaks to community wide about um, other issues that are happening in our community, things uh, like substance use treatment, uh, mental health services available. Um, a lot of the intensive supports that we can provide in, in our housing programs is dependent on those things being um, readily available in our community as well. And we all know that we're at a deficit in our community for those things too. Do we have the right funding? No, our system is very heavily relying on HUD sources, which limits our capacity building and sometimes also inhibits our ability to apply creative supports. There's a lot of strings attached to HUD money. There's some really great things, like I happen to love coordinated entry, but <laughs> there are some strings attached that really inhibit us from being able to do what we need to do for clients. And we need to look um, outside those HUD sources. Communities that have been successful and tackling homelessness um, have uh, looked to private funding. I believe in the Twin Cities, um, they're a really good example. They use their HUD funding primarily for uh, services such as shelter, and they look to private funding to be able to um, provide uh, supportive housing programming. But the good news is <laughs> that our community is doing some right things, right? We are making some good decisions. And I think an example of a really great data-driven decision focused on right sizing was a couple of years back, Cooley Cap um, had a transitional housing program that was quite large. I believe there was um, close to half a million or maybe even more than that invested in the program. It supported a lot of households, but transitional housing is one of those programs that lasts 18 months to 24 months. So shorter term in duration and providing a much less level, uh, less intensive level of case management. And we knew then, even then, we could see this higher barrier um, group um, getting larger and larger. And so Cooley Cap worked with the balance of state and HUD in order to reallocate that transitional housing program to permanent supportive housing, which was a really wise decision um, and based on uh, uh, the data that we were seeing. So that's a good thing, something good that we're doing in our community. 
okay, everybody take a breath. <laughs> I'm done with data. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about current strategies, um, what's going well, what's going wrong, what's missing, how we can do better. And I'm not gonna talk about um, specific programs or services on the continuum. I'm gonna talk about factors that I think are really impacting our ability to do better in our community and be more effective with the resources that we currently have and with resources that are um, coming down the pike for us. Um, data obviously is a factor. Previously, we weren't looking at it um, as often as we should. Like I said, we've changed that over the last couple of years. And there was that really great example of Cooley Cap um, making that reallocation. That was amazing. Um, another factor that impacts um, how we address homelessness in our community is the lack of affordable housing or the lack and the lack of accessible housing. I'm not going to go into that because I'm hoping that all of you will join us next week um, when we have Jason Gilman and Ashley Lisinski talking to us about those issues. Also, great reading is the Mosaic Fair Housing Report that the city did a couple years back if you want to know more about our lack of affordable and accessible housing housing. I'm going to focus um, more on these other um, uh, factors that I have listed out here. And then Mark at the very end is going to talk to us about housing first, because there's a lot of misconception about housing first um, in our community. So the first strategy uh, is uh, collaboration. So what are we doing really well <laughs> in our community about collaboration? Well, we have a really engaged community. I mean, I'm just looking here as I'm talking to you and I'm watching the number of participants go up, even as we're talking, 68 people are present here tonight. So we have an engaged community. We have expanded coalition partnerships. I can say from my own personal experience that when I started working on housing issues in La Crosse back in like 2014, 2015, we had a coalition that was mostly about 10 to 12 people that were meeting on a monthly basis. We represented a whole whopping three to five agencies <laughs> and we were um, sort of plotting along. And now we regularly have anywhere from 40 to 50 people attending our monthly coalition meetings. People are engaged, people are um, you know, paying attention to the issues, people are voting on our coalition issues. And we now represent probably over two dozen um, different agencies coming together. We've done a lot of work collaborating with um, partners that we previously hadn't um, partnered with, including the Housing Authority of the City of La Crosse. They recently, um, at the end of last year, um, wrote for additional to bring additional housing choice voucher funding um, into our community. And that was something we had advocated for. That was a really remarkable example of collaboration behind the scenes. I don't think it ever even got reported on, but um, the how one of the housing authorities biggest concerns about bringing more voucher money into our community was that HUD allows for such a small percentage of that funding to be um, uh, allocated towards the administration of the program that they often lose money, which is really difficult for them as a nonprofit organization. And so um, they went and met with our city and county partners. Um, our city and county each helped them to cover their losses. It amounted to about a $15,000 commitment on um, the part of the city and the county was able to help the housing authority with that so they could bring 40 new vouchers to our community. So $30,000 price tag for affordability for 40 new households in our community is a drop in the bucket. It's easy, it's, it's a bargain um, and was a great example of collaboration but we can do better. Um, we need broader partnership. We need continue to, we need to uh, continue to increase that partnership with our housing authority. I would love to see our house, housing authority dedicating a percentage of all recycled vouchers to households transitioning out of homelessness. This is something that we have learned from Rockford, Illinois, who has been largely successful in ending homelessness for vets and chronically homeless um, populations. 
we can also um, work with our housing authority to use vouchers to subsidize mortgages. Yes, it can subsidize mortgages, <laughs> which would be amazing because we often talk about how, you know, people on a voucher are often just merely surviving, but how do we get people to build wealth? How do we get people to become self-sustaining and then thriving and build wealth? Um, we can use vouchers to do that. So we need to continue our advocacy with our housing authority to include that service. Um, we need to expand our partnerships with local landlords. Frankly, it's always a slog. I'm sorry, it just is. We have some really amazing landlords that we work with with our programs, but if we really brought in all the money that we needed to in order to expand the number of supported housing program openings that we need in our community, we can have all that money, but we, at the end of the day, if we don't have landlords willing to rent us units, we're kind of dead in the water. So we need to really focus on expanding our partnership with local landlords. We've also done a really great job with um, case conferencing. So case conferencing to us is coming up with individualized service plans for um, uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness. We do a great job working together as a group of housing agencies, but we need to expand that case conferencing to include our partners at La Crosse County Human Services, the schools, the hospitals, and the police who all play a valuable part in helping um, individuals craft their service plan. And collaboration, at the end of the day, I think oftentimes when we talk about collaboration, um, we end up thinking about collaboration amongst our nonprofits or even a select group of our nonprofits that primarily tend to be focused on housing, right? They do a great job collaborating. They're good. What we need is collaboration at a much higher level. That has to include our government partners, our private businesses, and philanthropic and entities all working together, all being knowledgeable about the issues and uh, making decisions um, as a community. Funding is another um, factor that impacts how we're doing in our community. A uh, big, big factor. <laughs> um, what we're doing really well with the collaborative, we consistently increase funding sources and the total amount invested in our overall housing system since 2016. That has been consistent and amazing. And we've had incredible partners, uh, city, county, hospital systems, Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration have all been major investors, La Crosse Community Foundation um, in our homeless system. We have also learned how to invest for impact. So we knew um, when La Crosse County made available um, half a million dollars, we knew that prevention was something that we were really lacking in our community and is an integral piece to ending homelessness. Not only do we need to get people housed once they become homeless, we need to stop them from becoming homeless in the first place. We need to work at it from both ends. And so we invested that money in prevention and that was um, a really important, good decision. But how we can do better, we need to less uh, rely less on that HUD funding. It can be difficult to bring new HUD funding um, into the community in the first place. And oftentimes um, it comes with a lot of strings attached. And we have to be willing to look at our community resources as a whole, reduce competition amongst agencies and ensure that projects that are working are funded and funded sustainably. Um, I think a great example of this is uh, we didn't have an outreach team previously. We implemented an outreach team. We had tremendous outcomes with the outreach team. We had been funding it with some uh, funding that we call EHH funding. I won't get into the acronyms, but let's just say it's a state um, <laughs> emergency housing services um, type grant. We had uh, that grant money, that pool of grant money hasn't generally increased. In fact, we've seen some decreases over the years. And so for the outreach team to be funded, we had to take money away from some of our other agencies who are receiving a portion of it in order for that outreach team to get it. 
But because they were doing such amazing things, we were able to find a private funder, the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, to fund the whole project. And we were able to give that outreach funding back to that community pot, back to those other agencies um, that could use it. So I really felt like that was a good example of how, you know, one agency, I, I can still remember when I was at the meeting and I told people, yeah, we're going to give our $10,000 back. <laughs> and people looked at me and were like, what? <laughs> how can you give up funding? But it made sense. It was, it was a community decision. We need to look at um, the resources that are available as a community. And we also need to get over our sticker shock, right? Because when I say that prevention costs us half a million dollars in our community and people go and I say, we need half a million dollars every couple of years to keep funding that program. People are like, whoa, 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 what are you talking about? Where are we gonna get that money? What I say in return is where are we gonna get that money to cover the costs of not investing? And I give the example of a week in Cameron Park. Um, it's very hard, you know, you've probably seen data um, in other presentations where they talk about the cost of supporting people while they're homeless. And a lot of communities have done some hard work about trying to estimate those costs. It's really hard to do because a lot of the information is protected about individual expenses. But we happen to have a situation this past fall where a gentleman who had been staying at the Econola shelter for two months had really sort of stayed stabilized um, while he was there. He didn't have any touch um, with any of our emergency services. Um, he was uh, being well cared for, making connections, um, doing great, um, not costing our community a whole lot of money. Uh, when we closed the Econolad shelter at the end of October, he went um, out and chose to stay in the parks. He was staying in Cameron Park. Within the first week of being back in the parks, um, emergency services took him three times to the hospital um, for various services um, and emergencies. Um, fortunately, we had a personal relationship with him, a number of us, and we were able to get permission from him to find out um, the cost of his services. $43,000 in a single week on one human being, $43,000. So when people, kind of grimace at me when I talk about numbers like half a million dollars for prevention. I just want them to remember that $43,000 price tag for that one individual um, who needed help. Um, the next factor is the continuum of services. So when we talk about a continuum of services, we, um, I'm talking about the full spectrum, everything from, um, uh, providing prevention services to prevent people from becoming homeless. Once they become homeless, pro um, providing them in what we call intervention services, so shelter, emergency um, medical care, um, food, clothing, that kind of thing. Then um, being able to provide people with some sort of uh, supportive housing, whether it's longer term or shorter term, and then on to um, permanent housing in the form of uh, affordable housing options. So that's our sort of continuum of services that we're always looking at to making sure that we have adequate services provided all along that way. And what we do really well in our community is we've really kind of tackled that whole continuum. Um, we have supported housing program programming. We have basic shelter services. We have added robust prevention programs. Um, we have added outreach um, to our continuum of services. And we've added a level of um, community coordination. Um, how we can potentially do better in our continuum of services. We're still missing increased and dedicated services for households with children. We don't currently have any programming that's solely prioritizing them and dedicated to them. We have, um, we need increased and dedicated services for transition age youth, um, including a youth shelter. We're working on it, um, but we don't currently have it. 
we need to continue prioritizing that prevention funding. Right now, we're getting a lot of um, funding uh, from the government um, in the form of uh, COVID relief dollars, but that will end and we will need to think about how we continue to fund um, prevention services in our community. And we don't have any bridge housing in our community. We know um, from what I described to you of our um, population that we have people who with higher barriers, who have spent a longer time homeless, who are probably bound to be in shelter a longer period of time. And um, when they're in shelter, oftentimes in shelter, it's, it's really just sort of a um, trying to keep people alive, give them some case management uh, until they can, you know, get out um, into a supported housing program or out on their own. Really, it would be lovely if we could create an environment where they were not only sheltered, but they could be learning some independent living skills while they were in that shelter setting, especially if they're going to be there for a longer period of time. And that's something that we simply don't have in our community that I think could um, really be helpful. I do see that somebody is raising their hand, um, somebody named Brock um, is raising their hand. So, um, Brock, did you want to ask a question before I move on? Okay, <laughs> no problem. I just didn't want to ignore you. I saw your hand go up a little bit. <laughs> um, so the next factor is consumer voice. I'm a, I'm a huge advocate for consumer voice as a person who is a consumer of mental health services. I think it's important. You can't solve the problem of community mental health services without my voice there, without understanding um, what my experience is. And it's the same for homelessness. What we're doing well in our community is we created a um, Cooley Consumer Advisory Council, um, which is very active. Um, and we have uh, we have peers, consumers who are involved at every level of our decision making, including a consumer who is vice chair of our Cooley Continuum of Care, our local coalition. That's Randall Brown, um, and participation at um, on our Housing Authority Board, at the Balance of State Board of Directors, and we see more peers and services across the board, um, but. Again, we can do better. Peers need to be at every level of service. Just a reminder, I think the, the stereotype at one time was that peers were people who were in some sort of mental health or substance use recovery, and they didn't maybe have any other job skills. Um, so they were using their recovery as sort of their bread and butter and their way to make a living. That's not true anymore. Peers are at all levels of service um, with all levels of education and experience. I'm a peer. Um, I have a number of years of experience and education. I have a lovely friend, Sarah Eklund, who is the new director at Independent Living Resources. She has a master's degree. She's an executive director, lots of experience. She is a peer. Um, we need to have peers at every level of service delivery. We also need the development of additional projects that are peer run, things like Oxford houses. Um, peer run services is actually, um, peer services are actually evidence-based services according um, to SAMHSA. They're extremely effective projects that are operated by peers, um, offer uh, a high degree of sustainability um, and really great outcomes. Oxford houses, for those of you that don't know, are for people who are um, in the recovery community, who are living together, making their own rules and, and supporting one another. Um, there are projects out on the West Coast where people who have formerly been homeless um, live together and support one another. So I, I believe that those projects could be really helpful um, to our community and helping to um, keep people uh, from becoming homeless again. And we need to just continue our support for our own local consumer advisory council and be sure to incorporate their input um, at both our city and county level decision making. We also need to focus on accountability. 
I think each one of our agencies and organizations throughout our community, they all do a great job. They're all accountable to their own leadership, directorship, and funders. Um, we had actually implemented a quarterly system performance review where we were coming together as a community to look at our total, our overall community performance that started in early 2020. And of course, with COVID kind of went by the wayside. <laughs> and we did as a community also develop a collaborative strategic plan to end homelessness. We haven't formally adopted it yet, but we did develop it. So things that we can do better here, um, we can make our city or county the lead um, uh, uh, contractor on all of our government funding. Um, good examples of this can be found in Milwaukee and Rockford, Illinois. It adds a level of accountability um, to our system. We need to restart our quarterly system performance reviews. We need to come together as a group and review how we're doing and at least a quarterly level. And we need as a community to adopt that strategic plan. There's an opportunity, it's still in its sort of final draft form. So there's an opportunity to provide some input and still do some editing. But I think it's really important for our city and county governments to adopt that plan. And then moving forward as a community, we evaluate all new funding decisions and investments based on that plan. Is the program that's being um, suggested or raised up um, for potential um, funding sources, is how does it contribute to furthering that plan and getting us closer to ending homelessness? Um, it's, it's that measure that we um, evaluate all of those uh, potential opportunities by. And finally, one of the last factors is hope. I think this one is a really important thing. Again, we tend to get very focused on just getting people into housing and just surviving. If we can just get them into housing, um, if we can just get them find a landlord that's willing to rent to them, <laughs> um, then we're you know then we're successful. But honestly, we don't give enough people hope to not just survive but thrive. And ideally someday own a home. We do have a few programs that are doing exceedingly well at this, Marine Credit Unions, Finding Home Project, um, Habitat for Humanity, Shelter Developments, Francis Homes, and Cooley Caps Land Trust Program. But I think that we really need as a community to examine and redefine affordability based on our community values and information that's found in the Alice Report. And I'm going to just pull that up for a second here. I know we're, we're running out of time, but um, I think this is really important. Um, this particular page that I pulled up is the Alice Report budgets page. And it gives two examples of budgets. One is a budget on which people can survive in our community. So for a single adult, if you are making $10.81 an hour and you are only paying $526 in rent, you are able to you open survive. Thing, see some. Um, but if you wanted to thrive, you would okay. need to be making, if you wanted to be stable and sustainable, you would need to be making at least $21 an hour um, in, in our community. And so, Recently, we had a conversation with the Habitat for Humanity advocacy community about a local development that um, uh, was potentially going to go up in the Washburn neighborhood, 16 one-bedroom units at $700 each that was being um, labeled as affordable housing because people who are making $14.50 an hour could potentially live there. They could survive there. <laughs> They couldn't necessarily be stable there. Potentially, you're setting people up to, you know, one paycheck, you know, maybe somebody gets sick, they miss a paycheck, um, they miss a rent payment, they get evicted, and that eviction goes on their record, and it creates even bigger problems for them down the line. I think our community needs to take this uh, very seriously, this conversation um, about affordability and um, what allows a household to um, not just survive, but thrive. And I think it's important because another piece of Alice information, I won't show it to you now, um, is uh, 
is the data about the number of people who are at that level of surviving versus thriving. And um, the Alice report data, the most current Alice report data shows that in the county of La Crosse, roughly 36% of households meet the Alice threshold, meaning Alice is an acronym for asset limited, income constrained, and employed. So these people are working. They probably, maybe they own a car, but maybe they don't. They definitely don't own a home. Um, and they're literally potentially one paycheck away from disaster. And that's 36% of our county population. But more importantly, in the city of La Crosse, it is 50% of households. And so as I watched um, our community, uh, you know, our elections, and I watched um, some of our new council people, um, you know, go out there and vie for votes, um, our mayoral candidates um, go out and talk about issues. I heard a lot of rhetoric about thinking about housing for all income brackets, being fair and thinking about um, all income brackets and talking about um, allowing uh, our charities and our nonprofits to take care of um, our minority populations, our low income population. In fact, our folks who are at the Alice threshold, that's no longer the minority. The populations that have those in the higher income brackets, they're in the minority. We need to be thinking about the majority of people who are basically on the brink of disaster in our community. So the last, uh, the last slide that I have is about commitment. Um, and I think this is uh, probably one of the most important pieces. Um, what we're doing well with regards to commitment um, and engagement in our community is that we have more engagement and participation than ever from our city and county partners. Again, I can't express enough um, gratitude for the people that are in attendance at this meeting tonight. We have a community that's incredibly rich in resources, both financial resources, as well as um, the, the number of services that are available throughout the community. And sort of the upside of having a burgeoning uh, chronically homeless population is that we know these people. <laughs> um, they become homeless again and again. They're often very well known to us. Um, we understand them. We have the ability um, to provide the services uh, to them that they need. What we need now is that, um, again, going back to Mark's introduction, is that we need to agree as a community that homelessness is a social justice issue. It is a community ill that can be solved. We can attain functional zero in our community. So I'm not talking about ending homelessness. Nobody ever becomes homeless again. Life doesn't happen in a vacuum. People will become homeless again. But when it happens, we want to make sure that it is rare and that it is brief. And we can do that um, if we all agree to do it. We need to commit to making housing issues a priority at our government, um, at our city and county government um, levels. Uh, I think that's incredibly important. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark, who's going to tell you a little bit about how our community understanding of housing first issues um, impacts our ability to be effective in the community. And thank you very much for bearing with me. I know that was a lot of talk. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. So real quick as a break, thank you, everybody, for bearing with us. But I can spend a lot of really good information. Um, we're going to um, do a quick gear shift and um, talk a quick bit, take us out basically, take us home with a quick thing about Housing First. Housing First got a lot of traction in this last spring's elections and a lot of discussion, which was really good. However, because it's kind of the missing piece in terms of how we implement housing programs and how we help and support people. Um, but it's also a little bit misunderstood. Um, at times as to what it really is that we tend to really focus on the housing readiness and not having barriers there and that kind of ending up being the shorthand for housing first and indeed that is part of it but housing first is a whole a whole philosophy and approach um, and thought process related to supporting people coming out of homelessness so now as a quick break it is under four minutes I'm going to show you a quick video through uh, my screen share. Um, 
on Housing First to lay out the basic principles because they do a better job than we can and it's not us talking. So give me one sec. Thank you for letting me know. I appreciate that. That's the link for the video. Um, it's really short, it's really quick, but I'll quick review. Um, let me pull back off my, oh wait. Okay, yeah, we're good there. Um, oh, okay. So if you have a chance after, give that a watch. It's really worth it. Um, let me just pull back up my presentation. All right, so. Um, so there are five principles here that we're working with, um, and I'm just going to quick review those and kind of make sure that we I put a fine point on them. So the first one is immediate access to housing with no readiness conditions. This is the one that I think if you know something about housing first, this is what you know. Um, this is typically if a program is funded by Housing and Urban Development HUD, um, it's required that we can't have sobriety requirements or other things related that are preconditions to getting into housing. Um, there, that people are, if you're homeless and you're you know, breathing, basically you get to be in housing. Um, and so that's really important because we can't expect people to make, um, we can't put conditions in there because we can't expect people to make progress on their issues and barriers if they're not housed first. They need to have that, that basic need taken care of. Um, the second principle is, um, and this is where we start getting into kind of the more, the, the approach of housing first, is client choice and self-determination. And so this is that the participant needs to be in the center of decision-making as much as possible and in a meaningful way, like given real choices that matter. Um, that actually affect their situation. And, you know, program like a housing program needs to be a supportive learning environment that, you know, you can make mistakes, but, you know, have the support there to kind of hopefully not make them again. Um, and really the core question here that we have for people in programs is what kind of life is worth living for you? And how do we support you in building? And that's the key question about self-determination and where so often I think housing programs have issues is we don't get to ask that question. Um, a recovery orientation. Um, and this really is, we need to practice harm reduction. We need to support people in the process of integrating back into housing. Often we think that, okay, we're just gonna put you back into an apartment. You're good, you're good, all right. Um, and that's it, like that's, but it's a process to integrate back. Like again, homelessness is trauma and you have to heal from that. And there has to be space and support and recovery orientation is centered around that. We need to build programs around that, that lens. Um, and program and up further programs and plans should really be built around the strengths of the participants. Everybody has strength. Everybody has something they can contribute. And we need to help support people in drawing those out and using those to better their lives and make progress. Um, individualized support plan and client sent and person driven individualized and person driven supports. Um, and that, you know, homelessness, everybody's different. All people are different, obvious. They become homeless in different ways. And so we need to tailor plans and recovery to meet them at the places that they are that work for them. And we need to do so in ways that emphasize flexibility and build resilience as much as possible. So that again, making that progress towards self-sustain, reasonable self-sustaining progress and bettering their life, being able to better their lives and um, things like that. So. And then the final piece is so is promoting social and community integration. And so part of this is um, that when we put people, when we have people in programs, we need to support them in finding again that these answering these big questions of what makes your life worth living, what's meaningful to you, and helping them find those things, because that's how you integrate in communities. You find things that are meaningful, and then you go and hopefully do them out in the community. Um, and that helps you integrate back kind of out of homelessness. Um, but it also has to do with us um, that are, you know, people who are housed and that 
we need to be persistent and relentless in our ed education efforts and our advocacy efforts. Um, and so, uh, just moving my notes real quick. One minute. Um, so the the kind of final piece here is like, what do we, we do really well in lacrosse. We do do part, a big part of housing first. So we get people into units. We have agencies that have relationships with case managers and they're able to get them into units. Um, and we do that well. We, we do so without, you know, readiness requirements and we do that really well. It's just because of a lot of other forces related to, you know, landlords and communities and neighborhoods and kind of some of the lack of diverse supports and strengths-based supports um, and kind of some of these other principles, um, it ends up being that people who are working with housing programs, they're kind of just stuck like working with their participants kind of crisis to crisis. So somebody who has been, who has worked in, uh, been a housing caseworker. Um, you end up sometimes just getting stuck crisis to crisis to crisis to crisis. And you're not able to address those higher level needs in housing first. You're just kind of stuck keeping them in housing without any requirements. And so it's finding a way to build programs that allow us to build these supports and empower people and, um, and build up these higher level needs. Um, so that's kind of that. So that is the quick kind of flyby on housing first. Um, we are coming right to the end. I think we only have like one or two more slides. Okay. I think the next. Okay, the next one is that uh, Julie is going to take us out. She's going to play us out of here. Just one moment. So thank you guys all for bearing with us uh, through this presentation. I think one of the things that drew me to being a part of this presentation was uh, Peter's commitment, ongoing commitment to um, providing opportunities to people to thoroughly understand the issues. And certainly over the last couple of years in various roles, I've done a number of presentations to the community and always I end up getting kind of um, stuck, you know, with five or 10 or 15 minutes, and I could only cover a part of an issue or one very small piece of the issue. And this was just such a lovely opportunity to be able to really talk about um, the whole picture. And I apologize that it's just been so very, very wordy, but hopefully um, you'll all have the opportunity to go back and review the recorded session or take a look at our PowerPoint presentation, take a look at the links um, that we have included to the videos and to the different websites um, to learn more. And certainly Mark and I are always here to be able to answer questions and get you connected. If we don't have the answers, get you connected to the right people who can answer your questions. So we kind of wanted to wrap this up I love Mark's um, take on housing first. Um, that's another thing that we heard um, throughout uh, the elections and campaigning. We heard a lot of people say again and again, we need housing first in our community. We need housing first. We have it. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it sort of falls apart as soon as people get the keys and walk in the door. We do a great job getting people in, accepting them if they have criminal um, history, poor rental history, poor credit history, mental health issues. We don't do a great job with the rest of the principles of housing first. And that's where some of the things that we talked about with the current strategies, um, pulling in peer supports, um, could be really helpful and make us more effective at truly being able to um, follow through on that housing first philosophy, which has been so successful um, in other parts of the country at um, ending homelessness. So what can you do beyond, <laughs> beyond the things we talked about, <laughs> adopting uh, <laughs> um, you know, the strategic plan? What can we do? Um, what can each of you do after um, coming away from this presentation? Continue to learn, empower, advocate, support, volunteer, donate. Um, those are all things that we can actively do. Educate and agitate our political leaders and those with power. Um, frankly, some of the conversations 
that we've had in the community recently, that is born out of years of some of us kind of constantly <laughs> poking the bear and nobody wanted to hear about peer supports. Nobody wanted to hear about, you know, some of these other issues for a really long time, but continuing to agitate about it, bring the conversation up has brought it to the forefront. And finally, here we have this awesome forum for it. Um, invite and facilitate participation of our marginalized, our minority um, populations, people, peers, and consumers at all levels of decision making. Um, make them feel welcome, help them get oriented to how our systems work and how they can participate. Um, that is a recurrent theme in almost every conversation I've been having lately. Um, advocacy committees, the Human Rights Commission um, projects, we need to hear the voices of everybody in our community, um, not just those who are privileged enough, educated enough, and feel confident enough um, to participate equally. Specific asks for today, because I'm big on, let's, 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 nuts and bolts, let's talk about the specific asks. One, making sure our city and county governments are committed to making housing solutions a political priority, just making it a priority at all levels. Um, oftentimes it's that thing, it's a really hard thing, it's a really complex thing, and it gets kind of lost in the shuffle. Specifically, prioritize American Rescue Plan funds for housing solutions. I think we should ask for a commitment of a specific percentage. I'll have to give it some thought uh, <laughs> to tell you what that specific percentage should be, but I think it should be a large percentage of our American Rescue Plan dollars for housing solutions in our community. Um, our city is set to receive $11 million this year and $11 million next year. Our county is receiving even a large larger um, portions of American rescue dollars, we can make, we can put a significant dent in homelessness issues in our community by um, dedicating a specific percentage of those funds. Advocate for increased partnership with our local housing authorities and our affordable housing developments, including requiring that a designated percentage of units be set aside for um, households transitioning out of homelessness. Um, our city has done a really great job with this. I think we just need to continue um, to advocate for that because if we're able to help everybody who's homeless get into some kind of housing, we need to be thinking long term um, how to make things affordable um, for people for the rest of their lives. Um, and that's through our local housing authorities and affordable housing developments. If anybody's interested in some really great dry reading um, <laughs> usage. Um, uh, wrote uh, the United States Interagency Inter Council on Homelessness, wrote a marvelous a, a gazillion page guide on how uh, local communities can work with their housing authorities on ending homelessness in their communities. Um, the city is planning to develop and hire a homeless coordinator position within the city of La Crosse. So um, absolutely support and advocate for that. I think that is a fabulous idea. Um, and finally, as a community, we need to adopt the Cooley Collaborative to End Homelessness Strategic Plan. It, I believe it needs formal adoption by our city council and formal adoption by our county board. Um, and I think that, again, adopting that plan and then measuring, you know, taking a look at any um, potential new funding sources and projects that are coming down the pike, taking a look at what's in the plan, taking a look how this new funding source, this new project will fit into the plan, how it will help us to further that plan is gonna get us a long way towards being more effective in our strategies and ending homelessness. And that's kind of it. Um, <laughs> yay, we made it through and hopefully you're all still awake crickets. Um, I know it looks like we have, uh, we actually have um, quite a few comments here. And I know that we did have um, some people that had hands raised. So I'm going to um, mute myself for a second here. Or Mark, do you want me to take a look at hands raised? I'm going to pull up. Um, 
participants and see. I know that I saw Phil and Larry had questions. I don't know if Larry is still on. I see Phil. Do you guys still have questions? Do you want to unmute yourselves and um, and ask your questions now? Sure. So I have a lot of questions and we'll be sitting here all night before we get those answered. So I'm going to, I'm just going to ask a clear a clarification, ask for a clarification. You mentioned uh, transition age youth. I don't know what that means. Oh, I apologize. Transition age youth are um, youth ages uh, about 17 up to um, 24 years old um, who are kind of moving uh, away from possibly away from schooling and onto their own um, advanced education or maybe out to jobs um, and living situations. Um, we often use the term and we talk about um, uh, foster care youth who are transitioning, um, youth who are transitioning out of foster care because at 18, um, they're no longer a part of that system. But it's really a reference to anyone in that age range who is making a transition in their life. Um, and oftentimes, especially youth that are from populations, um, minority populations, like youth who are um, questioning their sexual identity, who are identifying as LGBTQ, um, youth who are Black, who um, are, you know, part of these um, minority populations, um, don't have the access to opportunities that so many other youth do, or they struggle within their own families, they end up homeless or run away. Um, and we, we do have a, a fairly large number of youth who are in need of services in that age range to, to get a better start in life. Yeah, this is Dan. I, I have a question. Uh, maybe you're going to get more in depth with it next week on, on what, what the available housing stock looks like. What, what do these transitions look like? And is there anything in the pipeline for future stuff coming online? Um, and is it even allowed to, to be constructed essentially? I think the codes, do the codes allow what would be a good transition to even be constructed? Uh, something that would be efficient, cost-effective and sustainable? I think if you're um, speaking about affordable housing developments, Jason Gilman and Ashley Lisinski in the presentation next week will be able to answer a lot of questions for you. Certainly, as far as available housing stock now, our housing authority has those additional um, vouchers uh, available in the community. And with regards to homelessness specifically, as far as um, stock in um, supported housing programming um, units, I'm not aware of any additional um, units that are being made available anytime soon. Um, so that's a big issue for us here in the community. I guess yeah, I, I will jump in quick. Okay. We will cover some of that next week for sure. Um, Jason, who is our former city planner here for the city of La Crosse and currently uh, currently taking a hiatus in his career um, to watch some grandkids. We'll, we'll dig into kind of housing stock and, and what the current state of affordable or unaffordable, I would say housing is. And then, yeah, we will talk more about opportunities to really dig into this historic funding that's coming through with the stimulus and, you know, what kind of, what kind of alternative housing models can be built since our current market system has not provided housing for a huge chunk of our community. Affordable housing um, developments, um, particularly using LIHTC dollars, I don't see as many challenges regarding zoning as much as I see challenges. They're just complicated beasts to put together. And I'll let um, Jason and Ashley talk um, more about that. So the biggest barrier is, is getting all the different pieces that need to be in place in order for those to happen. Um, lining all of those up, all the partnerships that are crucial there, and then making sure that the development is welcome in the neighborhood. Um, those are generally the biggest barriers there, but we'll learn more about that next week. Any other questions for us? Hi, Julie. I have a question. This is Mackenzie Mandel. Hi. 
Thank you so much for this presentation. I've thoroughly enjoyed every second of it and really appreciate all of the content and hope that that will be shared uh, by email with us. My question is um, in terms of developments that we want to see in the city of La Crosse, I'm wondering what kind or what that might be like. For example, I just saw as a council member that there is a proposed rezoning for the old red balloon building over um, just off of Park Avenue and 13th. And um, it'll be 19 units. And I wonder, you know, how accessible some housing units really are. For example, you mentioned the 11th and King development that's all one bedroom units or it was being proposed that way. I'm wondering what you, in your expertise would propose for something that would be more accessible that we want to see? Is it like a variety of different sizes of units, um, so on and so forth? Um, I would say that I mean, one of our biggest problems, we saw this problem with the Garden Terrace development a couple of years ago, was that um, the developer, um, they had uh, light tech dollars to um, make some of the units uh, income based. And um, we never seem to get developers <laughs> to um, focus on the really low income people who are below 30% of the county median income. Um, they always want to focus on the folks who are in the 50%, 60% bracket range. So um, if it's a development like that, um, then we want to focus on those, um, you know, lower income levels. And one bedroom units are always, I mean, it, one bedroom units are always needed. I would say we need overall throughout the community, um, a wide variety of units, but I will tell you that the um, project that was being proposed in the Washburn neighborhood, um, Kevin Biondo's project, there was a really easy solution to that. <laughs> and that is, um, uh, he was proposing all those one bedroom units at $700 a piece. HUD actually um, has dictated every year, HUD puts out um, fair market rents um, for every community across the nation. It kind of evaluates what fair markets fair market rents are at in each community. And this year in 2021 for the La Crosse community, fair market rent for a one bedroom unit is $673. Programs like the Section 8 voucher program can only subsidize units that are at or below fair market rent, according to HUD. So a $700 unit cannot be subsidized by a Section 8 voucher. And so the easy, to me, the easy solution was to go to the developer and say, can you bring that rent price down? Can you bring it down to $675 a unit? And mm -hmm. maybe it's not affordable um, on, on their own um, for a lot of people, but people who are able to get those Section 8 vouchers will be able to make that unit affordable for them. And then mm -hmm. ideally they can grow in place. If they are, say, young students or young professionals who are hopefully going to increase their income over time, they may grow out of being eligible for the Section 8 voucher, but they're still in a somewhat affordable unit and so on. So that was, to me, that was a, a, an easy ask um, of that situation. And I think there was a meeting tonight about that particular <laughs> development. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping that um, somebody brought that up. But to me, that, that would be um, an easy solution to something like that is um, focus on that fair market rent so that people can use uh, other resources to make it affordable for them. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And I'll make sure we get the presentation out to everyone who attended if you registered. And um, Mark and Julie, if you're okay with it, I'll send your emails out too. So yeah, we want this to start a conversation and for this, to keep going, you know, and the work to continue on because it's it's a long term project to, to address issues like these. So certainly not going to get a whole lot done in just one night. But thanks again for coming, everyone. Um, we really do appreciate it. And yeah, we will dig more into maybe some specific solutions, laying out, you know, what housing is looking like and, and what it can look like in the future, especially at this kind of pivotal moment with this funding coming through, as well as um, digging into some tenancy issues and you know. Um, tenant advocacy work that's been going on and, and how we can support people 
kind of one rung up the ladder that are you know really at risk for homelessness but haven't fallen down into that status and how we how we catch homelessness before it becomes homelessness so I hope we can make it to that and we'll have a recording for that available as well but thanks again for coming out uh, and we will hopefully see you next week <laughs>